session. The uh, work experience, uh, scientist in the National Chemical Laboratory, uh, assistant professor at Osmani University in India, research engineer and associate at University of Saskatchewan, uh, research assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, senior research scientist with fuel cell energy, manager with fuel cell energy, and now director. Uh, we can uh, say that he has an overall experience in the fields of clean energy and the environment. He has a PhD from the Indian Institute of Chemical Technology. 20 patents, 15, 50 refereed publications and 40 presentations. He has organized three ACS symposium, symposiums on fuel cells. And among his uh, professional affiliation is the one which is uh, related to the field with the North American Catalysis Society. So if we fix the problem, it will be a pleasure to have your presentation. <laughs> You'll have to pay much for this. <laughs> talking about uh, uh, high temperature fuel cells as a solid oxide fuel cell or a carbonate fuel cells. But right now, at fuel cell energy, we are focusing on to, you know, carbonate fuel cells offering in commercial product wise. For in this talk, I will cover on the aspects of how we can use you know, different fuels to make you know, electricity. And you know, we are mostly targeting for you know, stationary applications here. And uh, <coughs> since uh, it is in a name, I will go through some of the, I think, already last 10 minutes, I guess, in this process. But I will make, uh, make uh, some of the, uh, what fuel cell energy about and what kind of uh, products we are dealing with. I would like to give a brief overview. We call it as a DFC technology stands for a direct fuel cells. Why do we call it a direct fuel cell? I just mentioned about a little bit. And Saskatoon happened to be in a province where is rich in all renewables. I thought that. Even though we are mostly focusing on a natural gas-based fuel for the fuel cells at this time for the commercial applications, and we, I thought it's a, a more appropriate for the audience here to talk about on a, a renewable fuels how we can use this thing to make an electricity for a station. I think uh, there's a focus of my talk here, and during this process, I will touch base upon a different of renewable fuels based from in a, a wastewater treatment plants or in a biodiesel or in a biomass. Or landfill gas. And, uh, I'll see what are the things it needs and what kind of a processing approaches wise, how you can make the system compatible based on the renewable fuels. I'll just touch base on that one. And I'll also go, I think, from an, at the end of the day, I think when you talk about a fuel cell, it has to be economically feasible. I think 
we do wonderful work as in the university understanding the fundamentals but if you want to take this one into a practical situation you have to see the dollar sign and where we are and how we can approach this one i think i would like to go in a couple of slides and see the how reliable this is the uh, technology is about and where we are in the cost wise i will touch base on that one there is a very interesting uh, uh, one of the product we are looking at uh, at fce at fuel cell energy which is the hydrogen infrastructure as as you know uh, in the uh, dr sak he did mention and <coughs> a couple of other speakers uh, giving an overview the hydrogen how do you produce it it's not in a new technology but you have you know how to take the hydrogen but again as i i would like to refocus again back into dollar sign again so how do you get in a, a cost effective way of producing the hydrogen therefore uh, we have an approach from uh, the high temperature fuel cells not necessarily carbonate you can go for the solid oxide you can make the hydrogen also on site electricity generation which make the system very cost effective i think i will go in a one or two slides on that one for to give an a, a brief uh, uh, about the <coughs> fuel cell energy we are in connecticut in fce in the fuel cell energy uh, the one which you are seeing here <coughs> this one is in a danbury location where is in a headquarters we do the uh, the research and then and we have a field service the, and we have a product engineering group and this is in our manufacturing plant in torrington and all together we have around 400, 400 plus employees up to 450 i guess and right now as i said from 2003 we are offering this product commercially and so, since then i think we have uh, 50 units in the, uh, way back in an uh, late 2005 now we have more than 60 units has been commissioned uh, around the world europe including europe and asia and uh, we have uh, this particular technology direct fuel cell it's in an accumulation of effort was uh, sponsored by the uh, mostly the department of energy and a half billion dollars close to invested in this one to make this into a, a more mature one for uh, <clears throat> with this is in a publicly traded company and we have in a uh, right now we have another uh, uh, invested into in a canadian in the versa power which is a part of an fce we have a 45% stake as well there developing on solid acid fuels for uh, this one i think uh, just want one point i wanted to mention uh, about in this particular slide this is in a conventional one go from a fuel combustion using a turbine and generate the electricity that's all you know but uh, in the fuel cells there are two types i think in the morning we have heard about the low temperature fuel cells where is not mostly i'm talking about in a pen and where take the fuel do the uh, uh, fuel train it goes from sulfur uh, cleaner go to the net make in your in a hydrogen with an uh, no impurities especially for the co is one which makes a problem for pam therefore even though it says in a reformer it is in a combination of four to five different components within that reformer makes it all the fuel reformer itself is in a big uh, <coughs> system wise is in a big one and then send it to the pam fuel cell and generate the electricity but if you go for in a high temperature not necessarily the dfc here even the mention here you take the fuel and do the reforming internally and therefore if an external reform is been eliminated and because of you are doing internally and making the system more uh, uh, system wise more efficient i think in a uh, power generation industry whenever you talk about two things again efficiency is the key word there therefore if you talk about this in efficiency there is a slide i would like to mention this is in four different of fuel cells i don't want to So spend much time here, but essentially we are my uh, focus will be on this particular uh, technology, carbonate fuel cell technology. I think as you see that this is an availability of the temperature where you operate the fuel cells that make the system at a low temperature and a high temperature, and correspondingly there are issues are also based upon where you are operating. <coughs> um, <coughs> the electrochemical I mentioned to you this is an internal reforming this in a fuel cell. So what happens is when you take in a few hydrocarbon which can be in a natural gas methane and once you have a methane rich gas goes to your anode side this is an electrochemical cell basically your anode and cathode and the matrix the ion goes from one side to the other before once the fuel comes you are taking you are doing it in a reforming internal for you as we know this is an endothermic reaction and then a, your a electrochemical reaction is an exothermic reaction therefore it is in a complementary to each other and then you produce a hydrogen and it directly takes up by the your electrochemical reaction the 
before it is you are breaking the equilibrium and pushing to the reaction for 100%. For this is the uniqueness of this particular one. Basically, you are since you are integrating these two reactions and make the system more efficient. <coughs> there's the there's the difference between an FM versus here. Therefore, if you don't have any external reformer, you are doing it internally, and that makes your efficiency in a high. For uh, efficiency wise, I think this one is an, a, a very important one. When you saw, talk about an efficiency here, your uh, go for a turbines, the conventional ones, or the gas turbines, based on the system where you are talking about, whether it is in a sub megawatt or in a megawatt scale, anywhere range from 30%. But if you go for an, a carbonate fuel cell or in a high temperature one, you can achieve up to 47% a net electrical based on a net, uh, net AC. For, uh, for a system of uh, below 1 megawatt, we are talking about uh, a significant improvement in the efficiency. That's a very key parameter here when you talk about uh, a fuel cell. But, <clears throat> but if you attach in uh, a turbine, because in a fuel cell when you take it up, you don't completely utilize the uh, whole fuel. You have an additional heat is there and which you can come integrate with the fuel cell and that makes the system much more uh, attractive and it can go as high as up to even 65 plus. For we are already uh, working in this particular uh, uh, integration of in the fuel cell as well as in the turbine, which we are already in the fields we are uh, uh, implementing. For uh, this particular slide, I think is basically I don't want to go into detail here. Is how we make up in a stack and uh, uh, once a cell, how do we do it? That's what it is uh, given. I think uh, here this is in a whole system uh, schematic wise. How we take in a fuel? The fuel cell is in a one part of the power plant. Therefore, when you, the, this is in a fuel cell, but all the rest of the things is in what we call as in a man, the balance of the plant. Therefore, take the fuel, but where it depends upon the fuel quality, you need to clean up. That is universal for any type of fuel. It is, most of the time it is for the sulfur, for it is in a very, so very sensitive to the sulfur, and which your requirements are 0.1 ppm or so, uh, depends upon the type of fuel cell you are For uh, once you clean up, goes to the anode side, internally reform it. And then whatever the unused uh, <coughs> fuel is goes to and burn, you burn it and then generate the heat and that heat is being used up for the uh, air which is used for your cathode side and therefore you are integrated to the whole system as such. For whatever the gas is coming out of from the cathode which is in a heat integrated with the and to heat up your fuel. For this raw heat and as well as your uh, the whole system has been integrated to make the whole power plant. For as I said, uh, <coughs> We have an offering three different products. It's in a 300 kilowatt, it's in a 1 megawatt, and it's in a 2 megawatt. And essentially, if you want to go for a multi megawatt, we put it in a multiples of this one, making it to a 10 megawatt or a higher. And at this time, we are having already installed this in a megawatt scale, as well as this in a 300 kilowatt uh, stacks, and uh, uh, more than 60 units around the world. This particular one, uh, slide shows you how reliable this one. As I said, that you know, reliability is an important parameter. For uh, we went into in a, a commercial mode, opening it in a field trials early till uh, 2002. Since then, as you can see, that this particular graph is an availability. Availability means how much power is uh, all the time, how uh, uh, based upon the how many units you've been already installed and how the units are performing. As you can see, that we understood the uh, issues as we uh, um, installed the units from the year 2002 and continuously going up and we are uh, anywhere in the 93 percent for a uh, generally for a turbines related one it's around uh, 93 95 percent i think we are in a 95 plus anything is in a good therefore we are close to that one uh, approaching to the conventional uh, uh, turbines as well this is in a cost reduction. As I think the fundamental question everybody asks you, okay, what is the cost of your product at this time? In the, in the morning, a couple of uh, uh, audience asked, uh, I think in the breakout session, what is the cost of your product? For this is in a, uh, uh, at this time, when we started this in a 10 years back, we were talking about almost $16,000 per kilowatt in the range. For by the maturity, the value engineering, and then the over the years since then, in the last one decade, we are more or less close to around 4.8, uh, the 4,000 dollars per kilowatt for a sub megawatt, and then the megawatt scale because of when you are talking about a bigger scale, there will be a cost reduction as such associated with uh, because your mechanical balance of the plant will be reduced. Therefore, we are at this time right now, and we have a continuous cost out program to reduce 25 percent in the uh, next year and subsequent years as well. For 
I thought, um, I think the one which I mentioned about you is all about uh, something about my background about, about FCE and where we are and what type of products we are offering. And coming back to my the focus of the, uh, the talk today, for the renewable fuels is in a very, uh, I think the uh, focus has been changed at least I would say in the last two years uh, because of this oil prices increases and then less dependent, wanted to be less dependent on foreign oil for how you can utilize the, what is the existing renewable. Some of those renewable fuels, which we all know, are derived from, either it can be in a vegetable oil derived, biodiesel, which has an a, a potential, especially in Canadian, it's in a lot of canola oil. And then you can also go from a fermentation process to the biogas, where you can go from fermentation and produce an ethanol. And also this in a gasification, where you can also produce from biomass to a gasification. You can also see there's another potential fuel. And similarly, I think there's another potential one is in a landfills. And based upon the type of in a landfill, and you can produce in a medium BTU value and a low BTU value uh, gas. Therefore, these are the, I would say, some classified renewables. There is a potential. You can use them as, in a, a, uh, as a fuel for in a fuel cell. And we did use this and then demonstrated uh, plants in a different size. I will touch base on all these fuels in the next uh, five, 10 slides and what are the requirements it needs. For when we go for the biofuels, I think this is in a general schematic what does in a power of a carbonate fuel cell does require. For taking any these different types of a digester fuel or other types of a fuel, uh, biogas, uh, biofuels, ethanol or methanol or biodiesel, for you need in a cleanup. I think as I mentioned you, the cleanup is an important step. Depends upon the variability of the fuel, it does need in a cleanup. And then go to an a, if you have a low temperature fuel cell, you does require a fuel processor to produce an hydrogen. And if you want to go for any high temperature fuel cell, you do require to make it into a methane rich gas and send it to the fuel cell. For these are a generic way of uh, the unit operations that require for an a, even use in a biofuel. For, uh, for a carbonate fuel cell, what we do is we take these in a, uh, uh, different types of uh, biofuels. You generally see these type of uh, contaminants we generally uh, normally come across. If you are in a digester gas, sulfur is the one which can range up to 400 300 ppm. And in addition to that, we have an siloxanes, it's another SiO2 based compounds. And you have chlorides and halides too. Therefore, these are the contaminants which can affect your uh, fuel processing system or including your uh, fuel cell as such, you know, the anode catalyst. But it does require to remove, and once you have to removal, do an adiabatic preconverter. Therefore, what we are doing is whatever the gas you have, and produce them into a methane rich gas. Once you have an methane, send it directly and do internal reforming, and then uh, uh, then the system is the same uh, what we use for natural gas. For uh, bio, there is an advantage for the biofuels here. I just wanted to make sure uh, the most of the biofuels does contain a significant amount of CO2. That adds up an advantage for the carbonate fuel cell because of the fact that. CO2 is in a dilute in the anode side, but on the cathode side, it enhances the polarization, uh, your voltages. Therefore, when you add the losses versus the gains in the cathode side, you come ahead of the game by one or two millivolts. Therefore, that is in a very uniqueness of a carbonate fuel cell using it in a biofuel where we have a more much in the CO2. But for a BAM, since it happens to be in a, a dilute on the anode side, it is have an effect on the polarization on the anode side and the voltages will go down. Well, that's the uniqueness of the carbonate. Well, this particular slide shows you what are the advantages. Uh, um, so this one is basically the fuel composition, where how much you can expect the, the digester gas. You see, methane can be around 50 percent, but CO2 can be up, up to 30 to 50 percent, depends upon what type of anaerobic uh, uh, digestion you use. For you gain in uh, approximately two millivolts. As I said, because of the CO2, you have the polarization, the nurse losses is uh, lower on the cathode side and you are benefited by approximately 2 millivolts. Therefore, 2 millivolts is a big thing because that directly relates to your how much your output kilowatt you are getting out of the power plant. For here, I'm just for, uh, giving it a comparison. What is in a performance between a natural gas versus a biogas? When you see this one, here I'm giving you the two for a natural gas feed and then a digestive gas feed. What is in a power rate and then voltage? Depends upon where you are operating it in different power densities. Approximately, you are more or less in the same. You are getting there is no uh, performance penalty with uh, uh, operating within the digester gas as such. With the natural gas and the digester, 
this is one and the same, you are getting the same power output. So there is no penalty. <coughs> Here, uh, the, one of the potential uh, uh, biogas which we generally come across is in the wastewater treatment plants. The wastewater treatment plants, I think, uh, has an, a significant uh, potential, especially uh, in the US or in anywhere for that matter. 30% of our fleet is operating on uh, wastewater treatment plants. For uh, here, I just listed out uh, where are the units which have been operating on a different biogases in our uh, uh, sites. I think this is an, a slide particular one shows you what is in a capacity does it require to produce uh, say for an, a 10 million gallons per day of a wastewater treat, uh, treatment plant can support approximately 300 kilowatt uh, uh, power plant system. For uh, in US as I see at least uh, uh, 16,000 units are approximately in that range. Therefore it is in a high potential is there to make use of this particular application. And since the gas you are getting it in a bit, uh, much lower or no, a low cost value, and this uh, system is very attractive actually. <coughs> For um, again, the digester gas you can see uh, depends upon the where you are getting. It can vary a significant amount of uh, the variability, the fuel quality here. I think uh, uh, especially I wanted to point out here is the contaminants. See, one gas is in the 60 ppm and it can go as high as 500 ppm. Therefore, you have to have a system where it can treat for a uh, wide ranges of a contaminants. That includes in the hazards as well, which can go from 1 ppm to 5 ppm. Therefore, these are all uh, very uh, issues uh, when you operate uh, with the contaminants exceeds the 100 ppm level, 100 ppb, that's what we are looking at, the cleanup system. For here, how we clean it up? Therefore, once the system comes within 500 ppm or so, take some absorbent, remove the most of the sulfur, and makes use of another polisher where you can reduce the sulfur from 100 to 300 ppm down to 0.1 ppm, which is 100 ppb. That's our spec for going into the fuel cell. Therefore, it is in a, a significant amount, and obviously, we are looking for any good absorbents. I think in the morning, we had a couple of good presentations how we can remove the sulfur, and certainly, it's in an important area from an academia to develop in a high capacity absorbent, which is in a high value here. <coughs> this is an existing plant right now. We are doing it in a, a Seattle and King County uh, plant where we are operating on a, a digester gas. And in this particular system, you can see this is a clean up scale, how big it is, because it's in a sulfur you're coming at is in a more or less uh, 300 ppm or higher, or your absorbent volume goes higher, depends upon the how much capacity it is. Or it's in a big, uh, uh, high potential area to develop for an, uh, high capacity absorbents. The, <coughs> the another one, I think, as I said, uh, the contaminants, the cleanup, uh, we did look at this particular sites and we have a system developed which can reduce to these levels, which are uh, the criteria for going into the fuel cell. This hydrogen sulfide and the sloxanes and the halides. This is in a power plant, the complete power plant, it's in a, a King County. Is a two, one megawatt power plant we are operating there, and this is in a fuel cell, basically which has in a uh, inside that there are four different cans, and all you are seeing here is in a balance of the plant, and making the gas and then in the cathode side A, how you heat it up, and then fuel cell, and the integration of the whole system. Well, what I showed you earlier. For so far, at this power uh, King County, we generated is in a one megawatt. Uh, uh, power plant, as I said, we generated more than 6,000 hours, megawatt hours of uh, electricity, and it is in a completely automated system. We uh, monitor from Danbury how the things the power plant is operating, and we are see this is an uh, efficiency wise, we are about 47% uh, in electrical efficiency compared to the natural gas, even higher. As I said, CO2 makes use system is in a more efficient here. The performance wise is in a much better. And all our systems has been certified for a different uh, environmental emissions board here in the California Air uh, Requirement Board, which has been um, uh, standards, which is generally most of the power plants uh, taken into account for. For uh, another important uh, benefit from the fuel cell is the emissions, the NOx, SOx, CO, RNA, non-methane hydrocarbons here. As you can see that this is a significantly lower, it's an unmatched emissions uh, um, uh, that's 
one of the major benefit as, as we all know about that. Here I'm just talking about how it is in a natural gas, how it is the power output versus in a digestive gas, and we can interchange also one gas to other gas within a uh, minutes, and we can go from uh, say natural gas here we are once off a digestive gas, we shut it down and put the natural gas off into the system and go back to the full load. Therefore, it is an interchangeable from one fuel to other fuel, and still you get there is no penalty as such. But these are the different bio fuels which we are currently at the, in the sites in uh, US as well as in Europe and in Asia, uh, sorry, in Korea um, and Japan. And as you can see that, there's a very highly potential, 30% uh, of our market is in this direction right now. These are all uh, based on a wastewater treatment plants we have and an agreement with the beer, the brewery side also, the off gas coming from brewery. We put it some plants there and this is another Sierra Nevada brewery. <laughs> Side we have one megawatt, four power plants is presently operating. The another bio, uh, biogas, I think this is uh, uh, most of the time we constantly hear from the customers is uh, the landfill gas. This is in a, at an Angola, Minnesota. We did operate this unit, and this landfill gas again has an issue of a contaminant. Other than that, you do have a, uh, methane, which is in a medium medium value, and uh, as I said, we have an experience with this one. We know how to clean it up and how to use this gas and make it a power out of the direct carbonate fuel cells. For um, this is an, some system how we have a, uh, produced this in a clean gas after the landfill gas, which is in a raw gas, which is 48%. The important thing which you see here is almost you're talking about uh, very high sulfur as well as chlorine, and the system can uh, get back to the requirement what we want. And this particular uh, slide also shows you the natural gas versus an ethanol. We also ran on an ethanol, the dilute ethanol plant. I think we generally come across around 12 to 15 percent by volume, where you can also see there is no penalty as such in the performance of the, this is a polarization plot with uh, voltage versus current density. Therefore, is an ethanol is also in a feed we are looking at offering the power plants. At this time, we have no uh, 300 kilowatt system is running, but we are trying to develop the system at this point. For uh, <clears throat> some of the, uh, what are the system requirements are there? I think I don't want to go detail here, and then I just want to say we are uh, constantly working on, uh, we are uh, a high focus program is going on to develop a complete system to offer an ethanol based uh, power plants. Another interesting, I think, lot of, I think, in, uh, from uh, audience here in the Canadian side, you very well aware of the biodiesel potential as such. For uh, Canada, Saskatchewan happens to be, I think, the majority of the canola oil is produced, and then you have an, a, a very high potential of producing this biodiesel. Maybe use this as in a blended system, which you can put in a diesel for the combustible uh, engines. Or we also evaluated how we can use this in a biodiesel for power plant, our carbonate fuels and power plants are also. For what are the system it does require? For when you take this in a vegetable oil, either you can add methanol and do in a KOH or NOH catalyst, you do an esterification and separate it out, and you have a biodiesel, and this in a biodiesel, if it any sulfur is there, clean it up, and then uh, make it in a, a methane rich gas out of this biodiesel and send it to the fuel cell. For all you need is in a cleanup, and then make it in a methane rich gas. At the end of the game, I think we want a methane into the power plant. For how you can make it, I think that's what we're working. We have an, a, no product yet, but we are already working in this direction. And we feel that this is in a high potential area. And from academia side, I think we also feel that there's a lot of scope where you can continue to work on and developing some of this fuel processing system, how you can convert this in a biodiesel, for a hydrogen, if it is in a PEM fuel cell, or in a methane rich gas, for a high temperature fuel cells, and a high focus area. Obviously, when we need to look for an economics again, but the, as you see the sub subsidies and the getting from the government, probably it makes in a sense uh, uh, once you have the subsidies into an account equation. Therefore, uh, this one, has, uh, giving you a perspective as such, uh, we have a system developed. The natural gas power plants is an operating, the 20,000 hours plus in the field. And we have and also the biogas is in a very highly potential fuel. And we are already demonstrated and running in commercially offering at this time as in a biogas, in a digester gas uh, generated from the wastewater treatment or from a brewery, and essentially giving it a very high efficiency. 
and uh, we are uh, trying to look for a name. Obviously, everybody, look, we are trying to look for a cost reduction to make the system more um, attractive. And uh, at this time, the biogas is in a, uh, the cost wise can reduce because of the fuel uh, the cost will be much lower than that. For, um, as I said, having in a CO2 in the biogas is to make the system the performance wise uh, improved uh, from the NERSL uh, gains. And we're already installed so more than 3.5 megawatt, uh, and then uh, we continue to grow in this direction. And availability, which is an important parameter, which is a 90%, and we are going beyond that one, and uh, uh, close to 95% by end of the next year. I want to touch base, I think, uh, I want to take a couple of uh, five, minutes. Uh, five minutes on this one. This is a very interesting uh, concept we are trying to look at. It. I'm changing the gears here. <coughs> This is in a power plant, basically the DFC power plant. When you take it in a natural gas or in a biogas, you send it to the power plant and you don't uh, use completely the fuel. What you use is, is only in a 75%, what you call it as in a fuel utilization. For uh, there is a name, the rest of the fuel, it can go to a burner or and then make the heat, which can be utilized for your cathode gas or an anode gas. For what we're trying to do is, we generate the electricity from this power plant. At the same time, we, instead of uh, the 25% fuel which is coming out, we can separate it out and produce the hydrogen on site and uh, also the additional heat. Therefore, you can have a tri-generation mode here. And uh, I wanted to show you in a little bit detail on this one. Because as you say that the hydrogen infrastructure is the one which is in a key thing for an, a transport, uh, transportation sector, but the cost of producing, how to produce an, a hydrogen is a key here. Therefore, uh, it is in a very high potential. We think that we can produce this in a hydrogen from this our power plant at the same time producing electricity, especially targeting these are some of the industries which have high potential here. Uh, oil refineries, or in a, uh, some of the chemical manufacturing, or including some of the uh, wherever the hydrogen being used. For, uh, we all know about this DOE trust area. I want to go in this one. I think basically I want to show you this particular slide how we produce this one. <coughs> For all, you are getting the fuel, going into an, uh, this is an anode side, you are internally deforming, and you have a 75% is being used. This is in a value of the 25% the fuel is being exiting from your anode side. And essentially you have a hydrogen, is approximately 20% 20, 20 is hydrogen is there. For, instead of sending, this is in a conventional one, so you just send it out into an anode gas, uh, oxidizer, and with the incoming air, take the heat and send it to the cathode side, and that's our baseline system. For in the hydrogen recovery mode, what we do is take this anode gas, what is coming out, shift it, because you have essentially around 5% of CO is there, shift that one into a hydrogen rich gas, and send this uh, hydrogen rich gas and CO2 into a pressure sink uh, PSA, or maybe any other hydrogen separator, and send the hydrogen out and then CO2 back into the system. Therefore, you have an electricity and uh, you're also taking out the 25% hydrogen. That's a very, uh, and when you look into the economics, that's an interesting one. <coughs> Therefore, uh, when you get it, this uh, anode gas, you have around 23%. You're essentially, you can go with an 23% uh, of hydrogen which is there, which you can get it at a high quality, uh, pure, uh, uh, after the PSA. I want to skip here, I think, uh, in the interest of the time. This is the key one. <clears throat> Economics-wise, here you see that when you take a name uh, as such in a 250 kilowatt power plant, and you are generating a name approximately around 3.8 kilograms per hour. That means of, uh, you're talking about 100 kilograms per hour. That can support around 25 cars per day. And uh, if you go for a megawatt class, you can go for a hundred cars per day. And what is the cost involved here? The additional thing you're adding here is to make the shift reactor, and you are using in a compressor and then hydrogen separator. You use this in a cost, we got it uh, evaluated that one. And this is the amount it needs to be added up to the system. But operating cost, if you look at it, in order to have an operating the shift and the compressor, you need to produce some uh, parasitic powers. And those power <coughs> powers is approximately 47 uh, kilowatts. When you account, subtract this one, what you produced, the cost of the hydrogen essentially is coming down to three dollars per kilogram for an sub megawatt system. For the megawatt system, is clo uh, close to 2.2 dollars. When you go to the uh, DOE's goal is 
is uh, close to, uh, it's, uh, they are uh, wanted to around $2 or so. $2, it used to be $1.5. When you see that in a gasoline, one gallon of gas, it costs you, right now is in the $3 in US, maybe uh, 50 cents more here. Approximately the um, uh, value of uh, one gallon of uh, uh, gas is approximately one kilogram of hydrogen. Therefore, if you take that one into account, it's an impossible to make in a three dollars. Your gas itself is in a three dollars, and you are talking about all the parasitic. Therefore, it's in a very ambitious goal. It needs to be changed. But when you see here, it's in a, why the cost is coming down here? Because you are not doing any, any processing. Because you are producing this hydrogen within the fuel cell system, you are not any anything is uh, not added for the cost. Because it's in a part of your internal farming that makes your system more economical. Well, this is in a very high focus area and then we certainly see that it's in a very uh, potential to get what the DOE is asking for and we are at this uh, range right now depends upon the power plant and we have a for, uh, doesn't require too much of modifications we have in a uh, schedule of uh, putting a power plant in California later this uh, early 2007 for uh, it's in a, one of the very important project for us and uh, we feel that it's in a uh, potential where you can produce electricity as well as the hydrogen simultaneously. You have in a, a uh, gas station or in a hydrogen station where you can put a 250 power plant, you, uh, you need a power, power anyway, and at the same time you can get the hydrogen. Therefore, it is in a, a good uh, potential scope. For, we, feel, we feel that it's in a highly important uh, system. For fuel cells are not in a new, you know, it's there for a number of years. Or it's a, nothing new, but the thing is, uh, it's going up and down over the last 50 years, because of the cost and then the reliable and the robustness system. And as you can see that, uh, uh, there's so much of uh, drive right now, I think the stage has been reached. We think that it's going to happen this time, and we think that at FCE, we are ready to offer you a uh, system when you are there. Uh, thank you for your attention, and sorry for the, some problems, technical issues, in uh, going through this and uh, uploading the presentation. I'm very happy to take any answers if you have any uh, questions you have. Yeah, Ronnie, a very small technical question, which is at the price level of uh, the molten carbon of fuel cell that you use. What is the cost? Huh? The price level inside of the fuel cell. I didn't get your uh, What's that? Press? The pressure. The value of the pressure. Pressure. Is the fuel cell be operating in your plant? Oh, this is an all at this atmospheric pressure. This one is basically what we want. This one, the Buga. I didn't get your. Uh, What's the pressure inside the. It's atmospheric pressure. It's basically. Atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure. There is no pressure inside. This is only the pressure what we use is for an A. Our compressor system, if you want to take the hydrogen out. Okay, that depends upon your pressure swing or the last thing or anything else. Um, so, oxy removal. Uh, it's been claimed to be fairly problematic for some people. Uh, are you using a chiller method or are you just using a target And And so, I assume, would give a little currently and fuel cell a problem if they were. Yeah, that, um, good question, Brian. I think um, as you see that any biogas, if you take most of the contaminants that apart from the sulfur is the siloxanes that can vary from five to ten ppm. As you said, that there are a number of technologies that are available which can be a chiller or an adsorbent. And uh, right now we are looking all those approaches, and we have we know that system which can work. And uh, in terms of the name. Tolerance limit, as you know, that the turbines, which also use this one, which are more sensitive as well, the blades. Oh, yeah. For uh, therefore, uh, uh, certainly it will have any issues if you send it the uh, siloxanes into the system. Right. Then a falling right. issue is a falling issue heat exchangers before going to the nuclear cell. The next issue is it comes to a your uh, catalytic uh, degradation, which is in the form uh, coverage of your active sites, and before going to the, even in, if it reaches to the nano site. Is in a most cost effective proposition of removing a siloxanes in the fuel cell. For uh, siloxanes, is obviously is an, an important aspect you should consider uh, uh, the cleanup wise to down to the 100 ppm or even lower. Mm -hmm. One last question. 
what is the largest size of a uh, single unit that you have done in the brewery environment? We have a 3, uh, three megawatts. 1.5 megawatts I saw. No, this 5 megawatt is in a number of units uh, together, but at one plant we have a 2 megawatt is a one single unit as such. The cost of $3,800 per kilowatt, capital cost? For the megawatt class plant. For the megawatt class. But if it is in a 4,000 plus, the numbers what are shown is for a sub megawatt, which is for a DFC 300. What was the rationale for the brewery to go for a, uh, a power plant based on fuel cell vis a vis conventional plants? Because, really speaking, the, the cost is almost 12 times you, uh, for, for a megawatt size of capital cost you're looking at there. Yeah, so I think, that, as I say, that the key thing here is what efficiency wise is the one, the emissions is the one. Those are the two drivers right now. Therefore, uh, in the early adopters, whoever is there, uh, I think uh, some of the key early adopters which we have identified uh, for the backup power or in a, some of the, you see the wastewater treatment plants where you have any fuel is you know, no cost, it, it has a very high potential there to go for. And obviously, we think that uh, if you reach in a $12,000 per kilowatt in the range, then it makes the system much more uh, cost effective. And we feel that once you have a ramp up of you know, 50 megawatt and higher, the cost is proportionately goes down because in a higher volume one is, uh, obviously reduces your cost significantly. Is the operating cost significantly lower? No, operating cost, there is nothing other than your fuel no, cost. Fuel. Other than your fuel cost and some maintenance, which is being the part of the maintenance, which is uh, depends upon the type of the fuel, what you have it and then there will be a maintenance in a once in a year or so.